what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Tony Horton. You know what? You know, Rand, I like to talk about the challenge stories. You know, I really, I feel like it's inspirational to hear like, oh my God, all these founders are just like me. They go through the struggles, the hard times. And so Tony Horton talked about actually um, when he, before he sold hundreds of millions of DVDs of P90X, he was a street, like he made his food and rent money by being a street mime, a street performer. So he put his head on the street and people would pay him. And that's how he paid his food and, the, and rent money. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. And even on the show, I had him do it. I'm like, let me wow. see. If so if he wasn't good, maybe he just didn't eat that day. But it's crazy stories like that. And, and even, you know, when I had uh, Nolan Bushnell, founder of Atari on, you know, he was Steve Jobs' mentor. And he talked about how Steve Jobs, um, offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. So I know you have a story like that with the acquisition offer that you're like, oh my God, if I go back in time. So think of 33% of Apple for $50,000, right? And, and why he said no. Um, and in health stuff, like Julie Clark, who founded Baby Einstein, grew her company to $20 million with five employees and sold to Disney. But the most impressive part was um, her beating cancer twice um, throughout this whole process. And I know, you know, your wife had a, a bit of a scare too. And um, I'm going to introduce today's guest in a second. Before I do, uh, I'm going to tell you this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. And we help you run your podcast so it generates um, ROI. And for me, podcasting is a lot more personal. Obviously, it's, it's been the, one of the best things I've done for my business and my life over the past 10 years because I've made amazing relationships. And, um, but what's inspired me is my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor and him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And they were the only members of their family to survive. And so well, what does that have to do with podcasting? Well, the, the Holocaust Foundation actually interviewed my grandfather to capture the, the legacy stories before the survivors died and he's not alive anymore, but his story lives on because they did that interview and I put it on my about page on Inspired Insider. I watch it multiple times a year to inspire me um, so that I have gratitude. Um, so it's, it's a lot more, I consider it leaving, helping my guests and, and me leave a legacy um, beyond uh, ourselves. And so if you have questions, I think any business should have a podcast period. And if you have questions, go to rise25.com or you can email us support at rise25media.com. And, you know, Rand, I was talking to uh, a guest of my podcast, uh, Chris Dreyer, who has an amazing podcast, Chris Dreyer Podcast, and he runs rankings.io, which has a podcast and they help elite personal injury law firms dominate first page rankings. And we were saying, we were just talking about SEO um, and some of the most influential people. Um, and of course, uh, you came up. Today's guest came up, Rand Fishkin. I'm going to do an introduction and, and we're going to go deep on uh, his amazing background. But he went from dropping, Rand Fishkin went from dropping out of University of Washington to working full time at his mother's small business to creating SEMA's blog. If you haven't heard of it, it became one of the world's most popular community and content resource for search marketers. Then he became CEO of SEO Moz, which is now known as Moz, which I'm sure he paid, you know, paid a pretty penny for. Ma, it's Moz.com, like three-letter domain. I mean, I don't even want to know what you pay for oh, that. I can tell uh, you. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll have you tell me that. Um, the, it's a software company co-founded with his mom, and they grew that company from seven employees to 134. Revenues from scratch, you know, 800000 to $29 million in traffic building to 30 million annual visitors. And um, now Rand runs and founded SparkToro. And um, if you haven't checked it out, check it out, sparktoro.com. And it provides high quality market research and audience intelligence that should be available to everyone. And not just to tech giants and those with huge budgets. And 
if, you, if you're watching the video and you see over, over his shoulder, Lost and Founder is, I listen to three to six books per week, and it's one of my favorites of all time. If you really want to get a glimpse into a company and the vulnerability, he opens up the kimono and basically shares everything that happened, his thoughts, his feelings, that most, most of these things happen behind closed doors with private conversations. He, for some reason, decided to share it. Um, and we appreciate that. So, Rand, thank you for being here. Jeremy, thank you for having me. And a uh, good pass over to you. Yeah, you too. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, let's start there um, with the book and we'll get into Spark Torah. But I was, when I was listening to it, um, I'm wondering after you put out the book, what were you most nervous about? You were really vulnerable in sharing yeah, the journey. Yeah. What were you most nervous for people to read? Uh, I think, you know, some of those later chapters go into, I, I, obviously I had founded Spark Tor, oh, sorry, I had founded Moz with my mom, uh, Jillian, and then, you know, grew that into a software business and, uh, and led it as CEO for seven years. And then I stepped down from the CEO role and the next few years, uh, were very challenging. You know, um, Moz sort of did did okay for the first maybe year or two uh, after I stepped down, but but experienced some significant struggles after that. We had a a painful round of layoffs, which I write about in the book. I think that's the portion of the book: the layoffs, mm. um, the conflict that I had with the with the board and with the existing mm. leadership. You know, that kind of stuff is very difficult to write about without it getting personal and antagonistic and being perceived as, you know, sour grapes. Um, and, and I really did worry that many folks who would read that would, would come away from this with a sense that, you know, Rand is bitter and upset and frustrated mm. at, mm. you know, the company in the way that he felt treated after he, after he left the CEO role. Um, and therefore I have to, you know, everything that he's writing about, I need to look at it through that lens. Mm. Um, was that true? Did that come true? Cause I took the opposite. Yeah. I, I took the opposite actually when I uh, listened to it and there's a, there's a part where you, um, you're talking to the board with the layoffs and you're fighting for your employees and you should check out the book obviously, but, um, that you wanted to give them more severance and they were disagreeing with you because you're, you know, you were loyal to your staff. And um, I felt that you owned your mistakes and took personal responsibility and you, in the book and you said, like, I shouldn't have probably reacted that way. So yeah, yeah. I don't know if people well, took it is, other than that. I, I mean, I think you can, you can sense it, right? I think you can feel it when you're listening to, to me read the book or if you're, or if you're reading it yourself um, in the physical copy, you can feel this tension between, you know, Rand has these, has these feelings of frustration and, and potentially bitterness and anger. And he's trying to compensate for that by seeing the story from other people's perspectives. Yeah. Right. I'm trying to, you know, Jeremy, if you're if you're on Moz's board of directors and you're saying, hey, Rand, look, I hear you fighting for, you know, what you feel or your team and your employees, but you're not fighting for the people who are going to stay at the company who would really appreciate having a cash cushion and knowing that things are going to be okay for a long time. And mm. right, th those are two balanced perspectives. And I think, look, we're going through um, obviously a very painful recession uh, in the United States and around the world right now, uh, probably will be for a long time to come. And there are a lot of people making really similar decisions, right? About whether to furlough staff or lay mm. people off and try and rehire them or, you know, how are they going to survive this crisis? And, um, and, and I want to be respectful to, people with all those different positions. But at the time, in that board meeting, I absolutely was not, right? When I, when I get on my, you know, soapbox and, and I am sure I'm right, oh man, it is, it is painful, you know? <laughs> Just my, my brain can't, um, can't have- It's like the Incredible Hulk. Long-term perspective brings. It's like the Incredible Hulk. It's just like you yeah, turn into yeah, this. exactly. You just, you know, you're so overwhelmed with this, emotional response that um logic flies out the window what did that um you think help some of the relationships in the book you say you know it was it was like you felt a, a, a distance from some of those people 
because yeah. of that conversation after the book came out and you kind of almost, I don't know, you took personal responsibility for that whole interaction. Did you feel that that improved or no? Um, I, unfortunately, I think the opposite is true. Really? Uh, wow. Yeah. My, uh, my board and sort of, you know, and, and the leadership team in Moz, they were, um, I would say extremely nervous about the book. We in fact had conversations where, uh, we had to hire attorneys to have conversations for us because the, the, the conversations were so fraught and tense and, um, the, they didn't want to be talked about in the book is essentially what. Yeah, I think there was, right, unfortunately, right, the reality was that although Moz, um, you know, my my personal vision for Moz was always that it would be an incredibly transparent company, right? So oversharing and sharing the ugly, you know, um, parts of building a business, that was always how uh, I built Moz. And, and, you know, folks who might have been longtime readers of the Moz blog would have seen that over, you know, a decade plus that a lot of uncomfortable topics were discussed there. But um, I think the, you know, the existing leadership team and the, the board was much less uh, of that mindset, right? They did not believe in that the same way. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's unfortunate. I, I feel that that is my responsibility, right? I should have hired and found you know, a leadership team and board members and, and people to replace me and all those kinds of things who shared that vision uh, or I should have had a different vision, right? One of the two, but you can't, you can't have the inconsistency of, oh, you want this in your organization, but you've hired people, you've brought people aboard who don't represent that. Um, I, I don't want to, I don't think that's them to blame. That's me to blame. You know, we are talking right before we hit record and you were saying, you know, we built Moz in a recession, yeah, you know, right. and you know, right now as we're recording this, the U S and world are hitting some crazy times and I'm sure more to come, but um, talk about some of the lessons you learned building Moz in a recession and maybe how you're building spark Toro now because of that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, Jeremy, I'm sure you've had this experience as well where, when a recession hits, it sort of, it has uh, maybe what I'd call direct and indirect impacts that people feel, right? So the direct impact might be, oh, uh, budgets are down for marketing and advertising. You know, right now, I've been uh, looking at the statistics around Google ads and Facebook ads, Instagram ads, all those kinds of things, right? And inventory has just swelled because there's there's so much ad inventory because so many people are online, they're at home, right? They're quarantined, they can't go out as much, they're, they're scared of going out, right? Uh, even if they're not under shelter in place orders. And so as a result, uh, inventory is huge, but budgets are dropping. So uh, cost is very, very low. What you're seeing is, you know, this sort of remarkable um, delta between say three months ago when you know, maybe a Facebook ad would have cost you $3 a conversion and today it's 30 cents. <laughs> you know, that's, that's pretty crazy. The economy has not dropped 90%, right? Budgets are not down 90%. Maybe in a worst case, they're down 20 or 30%. And so as a result, there is a lot of opportunity. And I think Moz unintentionally capitalized on the opportunity that was created during the financial crisis of 2008 uh, by, we, we literally released our big software project that we've been working on with venture capital for a year and a half on the day Lehman Brothers collapsed in New York. That, that was our launch day. And so all the press- like perfect timing. By, yeah, yeah. Great timing. Great timing. Uh, all the press that was supposed to come by and, you know, do the interviews and cover it, they were busy doing other things that day. Um, and we, we did well in over the next, you know, six, seven years, precisely because uh, Moz unintentionally, but, but recognized that budgets were shifting and changing. And so people were looking for new opportunities. And one of the biggest new opportunities was uh, divesting from classic media spend and classic online advertising to search engine optimization, content marketing, web marketing as a whole, uh, and certainly organic web marketing because it has such a high ROI. So Moz, you know, basically was one of the first SEO software companies, probably the first kind of big one to hit, you know, tens of millions of revenue. 
and then uh, managed to build an extraordinary business o- over those years. Aspark Toro, fingers crossed, right, is going to be able to do something similar. Um, and we haven't talked about what Spark Toro is. I don't want to overly promote it, but yeah, we'll well, I want to, yeah. So I have a few other questions about Moz, and then I want to talk about Spark Toro. Toro's journey because obviously you take all the learnings from Maz and you, yeah. you're going to overlay it there. I mean, let's hope so, right? You yeah. don't want to go through a painful I experience mean, and then not learn your lesson. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. But so for, you know, one of the things is it's just people, again, people should check out Lost and Founder, but one of the stories in the book, which I was sweating when I was listening to was when I heard about you describing the acquisition offer. And, you know, we all have in companies, I don't know, no matter, you know, you ask people, what do you, what would you do differently? Would you grow? I don't regret anything because X, Y, Z happened. But really, ultimately, I think we we do have things like, oh, I would have totally done that differently or changed that. And so that was one of the pieces of the book. So I think it'd be important to talk a little bit about, um, maybe walk people through what was going on at Moz at the time, what transpired with that offer. Um, because I was just, that was just like a point of the book that I was, I just felt like nervous as I was listening to it, as you were walking people through what was happening. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I, I won't, I won't try, I won't spoil it for folks who, who want to read it entirely. And I think get the, get the full story, but the, you know, Internally at Moz, the company was doing very well. It was growing rapidly at a consistent sort of 100%-ish year-over-year growth rate. Uh, it was profitable. Uh, we had only raised 1.1 million uh, in venture, so what would today be considered a seed round, but for us, you know, we, we thought at the time of as a Series A, uh, we had maybe you know around 30 employees, not even 25, something like that. Um, and this acquisition offer was life changing. You know, I, it it um, it would have provided, you know, me personally. And how, how about this? It would have provided every single employee with more money uh, just from their stock options than all the money that my wife and I have combined today. For for any employee, right? For the person working the front desk at the time, um, you know, they they would have had. Uh, many hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, um, probably close to a million, maybe more than that. And, uh, you know, Geraldine and I, uh, my mom, the, the senior folks, right, the, uh, our investors and shareholders would have just made out like bandits, um, especially because the company that made the acquisition offer uh, went public a couple of years later, three years later, and that the, the stock, which was the primary thing that company was offering us, uh, in the deal would have been worth 10x, right? <laughs> 10, maybe 20x, uh, what we would have gotten it for at the time. So the, you know, the acquisition price was extraordinary. Yeah. It was quite good. It was uh, $40 million right around there. Um, and we, we, you know, would have been worth uh, a lot more than that. Yeah. So we, we walked away because I thought, I thought we could do even better. I thought that year over year growth rate was going to continue for many years, which, which in fact it did. Uh, but I, I failed to understand the mathematics of how startups are valued, how venture capital works. So for example, when this, you know, 40 ish million dollar offer came in, uh, Moz was doing a little under, uh, we were doing, I think we had just completed a year where we did about 6 million in revenue and we were about to do about uh, 12, right? So it was like 5.7, 11 point something. Um, so we were, we were on that growth curve trajectory, right? And we were being offered around five to, you know, five to six X our, our revenue uh, for the acquisition. And we became only what, three years later, we became a company that was doing $40 million in revenue. Uh, so doing as much in revenue as we were offered in the deal. And yet at that point, because the growth rate started to slow, well, maybe it slowed the next year after that, um, 
because the growth rate started to, to slow and the valuations of SaaS companies changed up, uh, we were, you know, unable to find an acquisition, you know, the last, whatever, five yeah. years uh, for a company that's doing 40 to, well, now Moz is doing 60 million or whatever it is. Um, there you go, right? Yeah. So you're, you're just sitting on private unliquidatable stock and be, you know, the growth rate is between five and 10% at Moz these days. So it's just not attractive enough for an acquisition offer. Yeah. And therefore it's very likely that some point in the next five to 10 years, Moz will, you know, be sold maybe to a private equity firm or something like that. Um, and, or, or, it'll, or maybe this recession will kill it. Who knows? Right. It's, it's yeah. hard to say, uh, but, very likely it will never get another offer of that magnitude. Yeah. And um, at the time HubSpot was the company and you could, you could hear the whole story, but, um, and, and the thing is, Ryan, the odds, if you look at companies that are offered stock options, the odds that that also goes in like a upward to the right positive direction is, is not always likely either. Right. And so, that was another piece that who knew that that would also play a big role, right? I mean, I know Darmesh and Brian pretty well. I should have, <laughs> I, I could have, I could have counted on them uh, to do a good job. And I think, you know, I've, I've, I've hung out with both of them plenty of times since, right? And uh, whenever I see Brian in particular, he's, you know, he always has this like, yeah, I'm really, I'm really bummed you turned down that offer. I think it would have been really fun to build this company together. I kind of have some. Shut up, man. Right. I think exactly. about it every night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like that printed out email under your pillow. He's like, yeah, I never think about this. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. And the, we'll get on a spark tour, but I'm going to ask you, you mentioned the beginning, Moz.com. The purchase of oh, Moz.com. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, so basic story was my, my CMO at the time, uh, Jamie Steven, who now runs uh, speed test Ookla here in, in Seattle. Uh, so Jamie had this idea that, um, Hey, we should, you know, we should try and, uh, acquire a different domain if we are going to be broader than just SEO. So at the time, you know, Moz's strategy, which ended up being a very, a, a terrible idea, a failed strategy. Um, was to broaden out from SEO and try and serve all these different aspects of, of digital marketing. Uh, you know, the, the sort of fear on the board was that Google might someday do something to us to shut us down because they didn't like us doing SEO. Um, and that, I think that those threats ended up being mostly just one Google employee who sort of was, was on his own. And then once he left Google, it, it was never really a big deal, but, uh, as a result, we sort of changed trajectories. We tried to acquire um, this moz.com domain, and it was a lucky break. So a guy I had worked with in the SEO industry, uh, Todd Malico, who I, I don't know if he uh, listens to the podcast, but it would be amazing if he does. He, he now does a lot of fishing tours down in Miami. Nice. Um, but uh, so, so Todd, who was a longtime friend in the SEO industry, knew the guy who owned moz.com. Uh, and that person, that domainer, he owned a vast portfolio of domains, uh, luckily was, was a friend of Todd's and a fan of Moz's and, and mine. He'd read the blog for years. And so we, we got what I think was a great deal. It was uh, somewhere around half a million dollars uh, for Moz.com, which I think is pretty darn stellar. For a three-letter domain, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think he, you know. That's a, an amazing gotten... saleable asset just in the domain yeah. now. Uh, he probably could have gotten twice that, right? And so I, I think we got a, a fantastic deal. Um, he asked for a lifetime membership to Moz. That was you know, part of the deal, which <laughs> like, yeah, of course, you got it. Um, but uh, but but really wonderful. And then of course we we had uh, we had some adventures getting the Twitter account and the Instagram account and the Facebook account and all that kind of stuff too. But um, the... yeah, Moz ended up it ended up being a great brand name. Uh, it was just the strategy of broadening out. Uh, did not work out well. I described that a bunch in the book and, and why exactly. Um, I think that, you know, we were not reading the room about the growth of SEO. We, we sort of turned away from SEO just as uh, that industry skyrocketed, right? And you can see the results with companies like Ahrefs and SEMrush and 
and, and many, many others who capitalized on the massive growth SEO experienced in the 2013, 14 era, just as Moz was sort of trying to expand outside of that field. And talk about the, um, you know, it, it became apparent from the book that you really, you know, you had a, a culture that was very important and you really deeply cared about the people who worked at the company. And what was the, you mentioned when, if you had sold at that point that the employees had different stock options, what was what you set up for the, the staff so that they would be, it would be a big win for them when the company was sold? Well, I mean, in the, in the early days, right after the first funding, a lot of staff owned, you know, somewhere between half a percent and two or three percent of the company. Um, I think, yeah, maybe some senior folks even four or five percent. But the, you know, the reality was that after the the rounds of funding that came later, right, we raised our big eighteen million dollar round in twenty twelve. We raised another uh, what was that ten million in twenty sixteen. I think at the start of twenty sixteen. Uh, and over the course of those, plus hiring a lot more people and then diluting that with by expanding the option pool for more employees, you know, it just became the case that um, you know, an, an engineer at Moz who might have owned 1% in, say, 2010, 2011, around the time of the, uh, the acquisition offer, today they probably own 0.1, maybe 0.05. Was it common at the time, though, for people to even have that stock option program? Um, yeah, I would say yeah. if you were a funded startup, there was almost always uh, an employee option pool. It was one of the things that came as a recommendation to us from our investors. Uh, we were certainly in our early days much more generous than most uh, with our employee option pool, but that, that, that was particularly surprising. You know, I, um, I. I'm someone who never separated personal and professional, so uh, um, which I think has positives and negatives. Uh, it can work very well in a small company. I think it doesn't scale particularly well, but um, you know, I I hired people I liked and was close to, and and you know, wanted in my life and loved and appreciated, right? Um, for both for their friendship and who they were, as well as for their professional contributions and. So that, you know, that those first 30 people uh, at the company, I, I'd be thrilled. You know, I, would, I, I think I will always regret not being able to financially reward them in the way that that acquisition offer would have done. Yeah. Um, so for SparkToro, um, I want, I'll have you talk a little bit about, you know, you learned a lot about launching, releasing um, yeah. products and the company, but... Where'd you come up with the name? <laughs> uh, so Casey and I basically had a list of um, criteria for our name. We wanted, uh, it's, the, it's the hotel uh, staff person at the front desk, right? When you go in and there's a, there's a clerk behind the hotel desk and she or he, you know, says, oh, and what's, you know, what's your email address or what's the company you're with? We wanted them to be able to see the name and say it correctly or to hear the name and immediately be able to spell it correctly. That was like one of our, one of our big things. And we wanted that to be true in most uh, languages, right? So SparkToro works reasonably well in uh, a, a lot of different cultures uh, and, and languages. We wanted it to have no meaning, right? To mean nothing else. So there would be no brand association, prior existing brand association. Uh, one of the challenges with SEO Moz, of course, was hard to pronounce, hard to spell, even if you heard it, uh, not clear what it was if you weren't familiar with SEO. And if you were familiar with SEO, it couldn't be anything else to you, right? It couldn't be broader than, than SEO. And so SparkToro, we, we wanted to do the opposite. And I really like the Japanese cartoon character Totoro. So that's where, that's where the name came from. Nice. So... Talk a little about what SparkToro is and um, who are ideal people who should be using SparkToro. Sure. Yeah. So, I, Jeremy, you are big in the podcasting world, right? And 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 love that. And I I do too. I think uh, podcasting, podcast advertising, 
uh, podcast guest appearances, podcast sponsorships, uh, and podcasting itself, I think those are hugely underrated, massively underrated. And one of the biggest problems uh, in that field, in my opinion, is that it is very difficult to discover whether an audience listens to a particular podcast and what a particular audience listens to. So if you and I say, hey, look, we're, we are trying to reach um, yoga teachers, yoga instructors in California, right? That is our target market for this new product we're rolling out. I don't know, we created a new yoga mat or a new, I don't know, studio system or whatever, a, a new uh, broadcast from home, you know, uh, you know, virtual yoga conferences. classes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. For remote remote yoga classes, right? So we, we've got this software that we, we want to pitch to yoga teachers. We're starting in California. Great. How do we figure out which podcast they listen to? Or, well, probably we're going to try and find a bunch of them and email them or reach out to them on whatever LinkedIn or their websites and say like, hey, would you be willing to have a five minute phone conversation? And then we ask them and hopefully they remember which ones and they're accurate with us. Maybe we do a big survey that we run all over the web or we pay a market research firm, you know, $50,000 to run a survey for us. Uh, or we just take guesses. Maybe we Google like yoga podcasts and see what comes up and hope that, that and that's crap, right? Like that, all of those methodologies are pretty terrible. There, there's one methodology we saw that works really well right, which is basically you go find the social and web profiles of thousands of people who match your audience description. So in this case, you know, look for yoga teacher, yoga instructor in the profile name on whatever, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, blah, 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 blah. You get all of those, you crawl them all uh, with a web crawler, you put them in a database, and then you compare the overlap of what they all follow and share and, and, and link to. Hmm. And that gives you a pretty good uh, set of, oh, okay, you know, 17% of yoga teachers that match California uh, follow, you know, have shared this podcast in the last 120 days. Yeah. So that one is probably the one we should get on. This is what SparkToro does. SparkToro basically crawls tens of millions of, well, billions of web profiles that represent about 75 ish million individuals. And then you can query that database and say, you know, I want people who frequently talk about mm. snowboarding. I want people who talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, who are science fiction authors. I want people who use the hashtag uh, GIF recipes, it, whatever it is, right? If you want to find an audience and discover the podcasts they listen to, the YouTube channels they subscribe to, the websites mm. they follow and read and visit, the social accounts that they are following, SparkToro can tell you that. So it's essentially on-demand market research software. Instead of taking months um, and tens of thousands of dollars, it's just you perform a search, bam, it tells you. So is it kind of like a Facebook lookalike audience on steroids across the whole web type of thing? Yeah, a little. It, it's not, not massively dissimilar from Facebook lookalike. So the, the big thing about Facebook lookalike is they won't tell you what they actually follow. Hmm. Right? They'll, they'll tell you, here's how many people you could reach if you... They do it internally it. and they just show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. They'll do it. They do it internally. Behind the scenes, Facebook knows which pages to show your ads on. Mm. But they don't tell you, oh, by the way, you know, Jeremy Weiss's podcast, that's, you know, that his podcast page does really well with this particular audience of entrepreneurs. Yeah. So use cases. So I could see a lot of maybe direct response marketers using this um, for online and offline purposes. I can see yeah, yeah. people who want to um, basically get in front of different genres of um, YouTube channels, uh, podcasts, advertising, and off going in and offering, sorry, and offer really targeted people to get exposure on those particular um, uh, channels. What are there some other use cases that you've discovered that are, are really good? Yeah, the I mean, the, the two or three big ones, right, uh, that we wanted to serve are uh, entrepreneurs and, and I would say early to mid-stage companies who are trying to figure out where can I do marketing yeah. in order to reach my audience. Yeah. Right? So they'll discover new channels with this. Not just, yeah, new channels and then like individual um, 
tactical sources to go after. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, we think we want to be in TechCrunch. We don't actually want to be in TechCrunch. We would much rather be on this particular YouTube channel that reaches our audience. Or, right. hey, this website, 15% of people who describe themselves as yoga professionals in California visit or share this website. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, what are we doing? Like, let's put a lot more of our marketing effort into, you know, getting mentioned on this website. Let's not just think about advertising, but how do we get organic mentions there? Maybe we can do a guest contribution. Maybe we can do a partnership with them, whatever it is, right? Uh, the second one, PR companies, right? PR professionals. We're doing public relations and that's, you know, their whole job is to find where can I amplify mm -hmm. my clients uh, work in order to get them the right kinds of customers that they're trying to reach. Uh, third one is content marketers, ton of content marketers, right? Whenever they produce a new piece of content, they're trying to figure out who will help amplify this and why, right? That content tends not to do very well unless it gets amplified. And so finding those sources for amplification is hugely important. And, um, and we've done that, but we, we've had a lot of people use, uh, use it very creatively uh, event marketers. Right? If you're putting together an in-person event or a webinar and you're trying to figure out how do I attract my audience so I can get people to my webinar, to get people to my conference, uh, to my, um, um, you know, uh, what should we call it, convention, what have you, SparkToro's pretty darn awesome for that. It's great for finding even just the speakers, right? Like, oh, I want... The, yeah, because you can search all the most influential people who, and exactly. so then you're like, oh, I've never heard of this person. And it turns out they're very well known in certain niches. Yeah. Or I've heard of that person. I hadn't considered that they reach this, you know, this big audience in my sector. Oh man, I should, that's yeah. the person. Or podcast guests. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Right. If you're, a, if you're a new or emerging podcaster and you are trying to reach an audience, you can figure out which guests you should bring on your podcast to, in order to get amplified to that audience, right? To, to, uh, to reach them. So it, it has a bunch of different Interesting. applications. It's just, it's basically just trying to solve this frustrating problem we saw over and over, which is trying to get this, this mark, this intelligence, this audience intelligence manually. And that, that's a terrible way to go. Software should do it for you. That's, that's what we're trying to solve. So, you know, what have you discovered um, in, you did multiple rounds of beta testing and talk about how you started to release it and then some of the feedback you were getting and how, how it's improved, you know, in each round. Yeah, I think the interesting thing for, for folks who are in the entrepreneurial world, right, is to realize that while very popular, I... Um, I substantively disagree with applying the classic lean startup model, um, especially the minimum viable product, right? The MVP model to uh, products that you're going to be releasing broadly. Look, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to toot my own horn, right? But I knew that after leaving Moz, a lot of people in the web marketing world would pay attention to whatever I did next, right? They were, they were going to see. Well, you're going to be under a microscope, sort of. Yeah, yeah, Makes right. Sense. Like a lot of a lot of people. There were know, twenty thousand plus people who signed up for our email uh, list to get early access or beta access to to SparkToro. And so, Casey and I know Casey's my co-founder, right? We know that a ton of people are going to pay attention the day we publicly launch. Uh, tens of thousands of marketers are going to have a first impression that will be formed in six or seven seconds of using the product. Right, and, and that impression will stick with them for a decade plus. I cannot tell you, Jeremy, I cannot tell you how many people after 10 years after Moz shuttered its consulting business would see me present on stage and talk about Moz and you know, talk about our software and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, uh, we, we were hoping to do some SEO consulting work. Would you work with us? I had this like, oh my God, I haven't done that in 10 years. How is that? Oh, well, I just remember you as an SEO consulting firm, right? So the, being able to change a brand impression of what in someone's mind is ludicrously hard. And I knew that was going to be a sticking point. I knew that a lot of people would pay attention to those first six or seven seconds. And so as a result, 
uh, Casey and I, you know, we raised some money, uh, angel money, not, not venture, in a very unique style um, back in uh, 2018. And for the last 18 months, we've basically been building and then slowly releasing to a small subset of beta testers, getting their feedback and input, polishing the product, trying to go from an MVP, which is probably what we had when the first 20 people looked at it back in you know, August of 2019, to where we are today, which is nearly, you know, nearly ready for public launch. And, and it is a very, very polished product for a V1. And that's what we want to be. We want to be exceptional mm-hmm. at launch. What was improved or taken out based on the feedback that you were getting from some of the beta users? Yeah, um, we, did a, uh, we did an entire visual overhaul. Um, so basically the first you know, visual sort of uh, UI that we presented folks with uh, a bunch of different things, top um, tab navigation versus side navigation. We, we switched from one to the other. Um, the uh, visual style use of, of colors and elements and all that kind of stuff changed up. Uh, we changed up uh, in, initially in the initial version, we had done a, um, a version that had events and conferences as one of the you know, sort of sources of input. That uh, after testing looked a little sketchy and we, we ended up testing uh, YouTube channels that people follow and subscribe to that ended up being much more popular. The mm. data was better. Uh, it was higher quality. We added a section with audience insights, including geog- geographic details and some um, text-based analysis, like what are the other words that people from this audience use in their profile so that people could figure out from, oh, a lot of people who describe themselves as yoga instructors use the word vinyasa. Vinyasa maybe is a is a word I should use in my marketing or try and reach mm-hmm. people that way or, you know, think about that as a subset of my audience. So um, that was an addition. Uh, we ended up having a feature with uh, CSV exports in, um, in all of the different tabs. We uh, changed up account settings so that you could see your previous queries, you know, lots of big and little things over the course of it. But, but I, you know, I think that stuff is less important to think about um, specific to SparkToro. And m- what's more important is the, the constant in touch with lots of people who are using the product professionally and you have a relationship with them uh, and you are constantly watching both the, the statistical use, right, on the, on the quantitative side and having conversations on the qualitative side uh, to figure out where are people you know, really benefiting, where are they losing out? And what can I do to make this product something that when it's released is going to, you know, have that magic moment for a lot more of the audience who's, who's using it. What were some of the benefits people reported um, after using it? So we have like, I'm, you know, when I, you look at Spark Toro page and people, you know, obviously the reason you chose a domain is it's easy to spell and say, so it's Spark, like, you know, S P A R K and then Toro, like bull T O R O dot com. Um, but there's so, like, there's a marketing magician, there's a CEO, there's a senior content engineer, there's probably a bunch of different people using it. What were maybe what benefits stick out to you of what people reported? Or what's yeah, I mean, reported? I think the, um, the classic thing of uh, emotions. Is the, is the biggest one, and then behind that is uh, benefits, and then behind that is features, right, in terms of how you sell a product and, and how a product is perceived. And the emotion that we're really trying to create is this is just easy. This makes a really hard, frustrating task uh, that required tons of work, and therefore a lot of people just skipped it entirely. Uh, it makes it easy, right? SparkToro is, is trying to do that so that with the, the first search you perform, you're like, oh, oh, damn, I did not realize I could get this. And so that, I think that's been, the, that's been my favorite reaction, I think, from people who perform their first search, even for free, as we've done you know, some of the early access stuff, and write back and are like, oh, this is, this is going to change my world. I've been trying to do this work for months or years, and now I can get it in a few seconds. Like that, That's life changing for me. Um, I would say the, you know, the benefits, uh, tend to be 
one, one of my favorite benefits is uh, agencies and consultants who go to their clients and say, hey, I know you told us you want to, whatever, get in TechCrunch, get in the New York Times, right? Get in these, uh, or you want to pay for a billboard here. You want to do, you know, big brand advertising stuff. That's not going to reach your audience. You told us you want to reach architects in Oregon um, or, you know, lawyers in Florida. Look, look at the data. It says they don't pay attention to that channel or that source that you thought they did. They pay attention to this source. Mm. That's the one we should go after. And so just that percent following number is hugely mm. meaningful to a bunch of those folks because they, they can finally pitch with data, right? They don't have to rely on, well, our CEO says that a lot of, he talked to a bunch of his colleagues and they all say they read the Wall Street Journal. So let's do an ad in the Wall Street Journal. No, look, I have the data. You know, your yeah. CEO is wrong. Yeah, so it's not just making, help people make money, it's saving them money of wasted spend they would have spent on something that didn't work. Yeah, something that doesn't actually reach their audience, right? I think this is, you know, the big promise of Google and Facebook's uh, model, right? The duopoly of, of online advertising right now is we know where to place your ad so that the right people see it. And the frustrating part of that is we won't tell you There's where no we're visibility. Doing that. No visibility on the back end, right? So you, you get the clicks and maybe it's performing, but you're bidding against everyone else. So it's very, very expensive. And SparkToro's promise is, no, no, you don't, you don't have to pay us to, to put your ad up. We will tell you where your audience pays attention. You go do whatever organic or paid forms of marketing you want to do that are effective for you uh, and effective for them. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, it gives me a bunch of ideas. Um, how do you decide on pricing? Uh, did you always uh, knew there'd be a free free version or right now there's a free version? But. Yeah, yeah, we, we wanted to make sure that um, people who could not afford a paid package could still get a lot of benefit from it, right? That, um, I don't know, that's always been kind of part of my ethos that, that look, I uh, obviously do want to, you know, I, I am a capitalist. I do want to uh, do well for our investors and, and for the team, but um, my goal is to help people first. And so, yeah, being able to run a few free searches every month and, and get value from that and see the data. And I think that's a, it's a nice way also to uh, separate folks who I can only barely afford this. And I'm also only barely going to use it from folks who are like, oh, I have plenty of money to use this. I will get a lot of benefit from it. So I can certainly afford to pay you. And after running a few free searches, I can see that this is gonna be valuable for me. So great. Um, and we have, yeah, we have about, I think around 150-ish paying customers uh, as we're having this conversation, right? In the uh, spring of 2020. And and the, um, you know, the, the hope is that we would provide a relatively low cost package. So we wanted something where, you know, your average marketer who's a consultant at an agency or who's in house could put it on their company card and it would be underneath the budget amount where they have to get approval. So it starts at, I think 150 a month. Yeah. What's interesting is you have this seven day pass. Yeah. yeah I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen that before. How did that come about? Uh, so we had conversations with a bunch of agencies in particular. Uh, I remember one, I was at a conference in, uh, in Victoria, um, BC. This was, I guess this was last year. And I was talking to the owners of the agency and they said, you know, one of the things that we really hate about SaaS pricing, software as a service pricing, is that every, for every subscription that we get, you know, they, we ch they charge us monthly but we can't pass that billing on to our client, right? We're, we might be using the subscription for a client, but if we use it for two or more clients, it becomes our cost rather than a cost we can directly put on our bill for our clients. And that really sucks. Hmm. So what we, what we really like is some way for us to be able to basically pay you per project we need to do. When we need to do market research for a client, uh, which might be very heavy use for only a week or two, we would love to just be able to charge, you know, pay that money and then charge our client for that research. And so we created this 
seven day pass, right? One, one time use, no recurring billing um, package for, I, I think it's, you know, uh, the, the equivalent of having a very, very high level subscription uh, for a week. And that has turned out to be popular. I think of our, so we've had uh, maybe 190 total people sign up and pay for SparkToro. And I think 10 or 12 of those have used the one week package. So not quite yeah. 10%, but it's significant, you know, it's yeah. significant revenue. And we, we're not venture back. So we don't have to be obsessed with metrics like, you know, um, uh, recurring revenue amount and what's recurring versus non-recurring. We're, we're just a, you know, we're a normal business. We're an LLC, right? Uh, we care about profits. We care about making our customers happy. Uh, and so we can afford to do things a little differently, including this, this seven day pass thing. Yeah. First of all, Rand, I want to be the first one to thank you for sharing your knowledge, for doing what you do for your book and everything else. So people should check out lost and founder, Amazon, audible, wherever you get the book. Um, and, uh, check out sparktoro.com. Um, when any, any last parting words that we should tell people about spark Toro and anywhere else we should point people towards. Yeah. Well, I think, um, Look, I, I have a lot of empathy for what entrepreneurs and uh, folks in early stage companies are going through right now. I have been there myself and, and obviously I am there. And I, I just, um, you know, I want to say that I think, I think it's a great time to <clears throat> be thoughtful about uh, your expenses, but also be thoughtful about your, your customers and your team. Um, and I, I have seen many, many times that, that people who, um, people who truly read the room and, uh, and understand their audiences, uh, tend to outperform their competitors, especially in times like this. So I, um, yeah, I urge you to do that. And, cool. and Jeremy, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Check out sparktoro.com and, uh, stay safe out there. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand